Freeze and days we cook. Alrighty, um, I didn't come through for you on the projects. <laughs> I uh, I will do them over Thanksgiving. So next Monday we'll have the projects ready to go, graded back, graded and all done. Um, the hopefully new project comes out today. We I've worked it out with the TAs. I haven't actually seen the pro seen it yet. We've kind of got all the ground rules. So hopefully that'll get on the web today. The homework is not due till next. Monday, right? And late ones will come due on Wednesday of next week. Okay. Uh, I guess that's it. Uh, any other any things I should be talking about? Problem three: You don't have to tie the. You can tie the source to the substrate. Problem three: Tie the source to something. TA should put that on the news group, hopefully. Makes a problem too hard, otherwise. Okay, so let me tell you what's left. Um, today I'll do a little more stability, and I'll just kind of open up for, I'll review stability and feedback for the rest of the lecture today. Uh, think about some questions. If you have some questions you want me to look at, I'll certainly do that today. Probably the rest of the year, I guess we have four lectures left. Okay. Um, <laughs> With some music, even too. I'll be very, very relaxed the rest of the year now, right? Um, we're gonna. Uh, I'll do a couple of lectures probably on this RF design, okay? Just kind of expose you to a little bit, and and uh, we'll hand out a homework set on that that'll be optional. Optional means here's how we're gonna do it. Uh, you can do it, and if you do it, you can. If you missed a homework before, okay. You can replace that homework, or it can be if, if you did a really ill. I always I'll take the bottom. If you, if you do if you did uh, bad on one homework and this one you do well on this one, I'll replace that score with this new score. Okay, so basically it can uh, only help you, can't hurt you if you want to do it. Okay, so uh, but it's optional because I don't want to do homeworks and projects in time. Wait. Wait, so if you do do this homework and you happen to get the lowest score on this homework, will this homework be the drop then? And then what would have been your drop before would not be dropped? <laughs> <laughs> no. So uh, you drop two then? I'll drop effectively two. Okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Always thinking. Okay, so. All right. Um, Projects will be the last day of classes. Like, or Monday, I guess we had Monday after the semester's over with. I guess when we had the, so you have one more week and week do it. It's on the it's on the website. What the when it's due. Okay, so we'll do that, and I'll, I guess I'll do some examples. I'll start going so use of all the stuff we've been doing, some filters and A to D converters, just kind of show you what these circuits look like, so you can sort of what you've. What you've done, what you have after you finish this class, is you really have the core of being able to put together really very sophisticated circuits. Because what you, what you do is you take the blocks that we've learned how to do, you know, the op amps and the amplifiers we've learned how to do, and you put them together with capacitors and switches, okay, which are fairly straightforward things to design with, and you can make A to D converters and D to A converters and, you know. All sorts of other stuff. Now, what we do don't do in this class is nonlinear circuits. Okay, 
Like in RF, you'll have to do mixers, which is basically a multiplication. Well, that's a nonlinear circuit, and we don't do that here. That's sort of 142. So that's kind of an extension of the material we do here. Um, some of you asked me, what do you do in 240? You know, 240, I mentioned last time a little bit, you know, you'll do more complicated circuits like fully differential input, fully differential output. That has some extra complications. You worry about noise issues. We, I'll talk a little bit about noise when we do the RF stuff because that's so important. The circuits for RF are very simple, except their noise is a much more sensitive issue there, so you have to deal with that. Um, uh, what else to 140? I think 240 is matching you know, a lot of issues on you know, temperature dependence and what happens if the transistors aren't exactly the same. You always say, well, this, is, this side is exactly like this side. What happens if it's not? And how do you analyze that? Another thing we haven't worried about in this class is power supply rejection. Here's another good one for you to think about. Often what happens in a circuit, in a real use and real application, there's noise on the power supplies. We worried about the power supplies changing voltage, right? But we also have to worry about noise being on that power supply, okay? And so the question then you have to worry about is, does noise come through the power supply and into your circuit path, okay? So you have to worry about some other paths for your signal to get through. That's something you can design against. You can make good circuits that have good power supply rejection. This is noise in the power supply lines. So it's basically a gain from the power supply through to your output. Right? So this is all, these are all more sophisticated things you need to do to make circuits you know, more, you know, more reliable in their application. Right? So that's how do you do stuff in 240? But you got the core right now of what, what, of what, how you do circuit design. Okay, um, let me. Actually, I had a uh, in office hours today. Uh, one person asked me a question, and uh, you know, it, it had to do with I talked about the slew rate and um, uh, relationship to. Um, the compensation capacitor, I ended up with this formula, VD sat 2 times omega P2, you know, and I kind of, last time I said, well, it's, this is sort of a large signal and a small signal analysis combined. Really what this formula, what does this formula come from? This formula is the formula for slew rate when the phase margin is equal to 45 degrees. That's basically what the constraint is. So I, what I've done is I said, okay, let's design for a stability criteria of a 45 degrees phase margin. If that's true, this is what your slew rate answer will be. VD sat times omega P2, the second pole. So that's kind of really what I meant by mixing the design equations around. I think that's kind of an easy way to think about it. Would this equation be different if theta M was equal to 60 degrees? Yeah, it would be a little bit different. Not much. There'd be some little coefficient out in front here, I don't know, square root of 2 or something like that. So this base dependency on the VD sat and omega P2 will still be the same. There'll be some little factor sitting out in front there. Okay, so. Um, might be a good problem for a test. Yeah, right, well, right, right. <laughs> Why do you choose um, uh, that phase margin to be 45? Because, like, isn't 60 kind of settled faster? Yeah. Well, actually, 60 settles. 45 has a little bit of ringing to it. 60 is kind of critically damped, I think. The reason I use 45 because it's easy, right? I mean, 45 degrees phase margin because you get nine. This is omega compensation, and here's our first non-dominant pole. Okay. For 45 degrees of phase margin, what I have to say is the gain needs to be one right at that non-dominant pole, right? So gains one at that. So then I can calculate this omega compensation as being equals the non-dominant pole divided by A0, right? Or F times A0, right? If it's loop gain, right? We're talking about, right? So it's just that convenience, OK? If I ask you for 60 degrees of phase margin, then the gain would have to be at I mean, we have we have to use. so for 60 degrees of phase margin, theta is equal to the arc tangent of omega over omega 
non-dominant. Okay, so where is the, what is the frequency? Now this is the phase from the second pole, from the non-dominant pole. If we're ten times above the compensation pole, so that means we've got 90 degrees from. So we so our total phase shift is equal to 90 degrees, or minus 90 degrees, from the first pole. This is the mega, from omega C, okay, minus the arc tangent of omega over omega non-dominant. So this is the phase shift from the second pole. So if I want it to be 60 degrees of phase margin at this point, what frequency will that be at? So let's figure that out, um, 60 degrees of phase margin means a total phase shift you know, it's of 120 degrees, right? So it's 180 degrees minus the phase shift is equal to the phase margin. Okay, so, so, so I have a total phase shift of 120 degrees. If I get 90 from the first pole, that means I'm going to get minus 30 degrees from the second pole instead of 45, which was right at the second pole. So I can solve this little equation here. So tangent of omega over omega non-dominant equals to 30 degrees. Or what is that? Our tangent of that, right? Tangent of that. Not our tangent of that, right? Okay, tangent of that. And so then omega equals to omega non-dominant times the arc tangent of 30 degrees. Okay, so that could then tell me what frequency I need to have, and I know someone have that. Uh, it's like root three or something, root three over two, or 0.866 or something like that. I think it's 0.866. So it's 0.866 times omega non-dominant. So it's a little bit lower than the omega non-dominant, where I get. So at this point, I'm getting. <laughs> 30 degrees of minus 30 degrees of phase shift plus the minus 90 from the first pole, I get minus 120 at this point. So now I have to sort of, instead of having, so for 60 degrees of phase margin, I have to have the one answer occur here. So what's that going to be? Well, that means I have to have, instead of having this at mega non-dominant or f times a0, if it's 0.866 omega non-dominant, where I get 120 degrees of a phase shift, this will have to be mega non-dominant times 0.866. Okay. All right. So I just so you can figure out if I have a different phase shift, you can just gotta figure out where that point is, make that where the gain's one, and that gives you the phase margin. Basically you multiply by the tangent angle. May, basically multiply the tangent angle. Because right. when this was equal to mega for 45 degrees of phase margin, right, this I put 45 here, what would I get? That's, this is equal to 1, right? So omega equals mega non-dominant. So that's the, why the 45 degree case comes out right at that point. Right. If I had less phase margin, if I had you know, 30 degrees of phase margin, then I'd have to have 90 degrees from the first one. 30 degrees of phase margin means a total phase shift of 150. So that means 60 degrees of phase margin from the second pole, so I'd be sitting down here somewhere. Right. So it'd be one point something or other, 1.33 or something. Okay? With that? So we can work. Question. With, yeah. I was wondering, did you switch to tangent and arc tangent? Yeah, I did. <laughs> this is, should be tangent here, right? It, it should arc Oh, it should be arc tangent. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, so our tangent is right here. Tangent down here, right? Yep. Tangent right there too. I'll get it right yet. This is our tangent here. I was right to start with it. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. No, right? Mega equals tangent of forty-five degrees. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, to figure out the slew rate, we kind of just begin this last time. When is the worst case slew rate problem? For a sine wave, which is often we worry about, this, the worst case condition, when you just take the derivative of this expression, of this 
uh, of this waveform, right? So if the waveform is A, amplitude A times sine of omega S times T, omega S is some signal frequency, just some arbitrary signal, a tone that's going through our amplifier. I take the derivative of this, and I get omega S times A. So this is giving me the slope, right? And of course, it's omega S times A times cosine omega S times T. Well, this becomes maximum when omega S T is equal to 0 or pi and so on, OK? Plus or minus. And that happens right at these points right here, OK? So that's the maximum rate of change. So you can calculate the maximum s slope of this waveform. It's going to be omega s times a times, and the maximum will be when this is equal to 1. It will be 0 up here, so that's really a small slope. So you look at this right here, and it's a function of the, of the frequency, how fast the sine wave is, versus the amplitude, too. So as you get bigger amplitude, which you can, you can begin to go into slewing as a portion of your waveform. So you've got to design for the worst case condition, omega s times a, which is and make your slew rate greater than that. So here I said, OK, if a megahertz signal, so I've got to change it to megahertz, I change it to radians times 2 pi, 2 volt signal, then I have to have a 13 volt per microsecond. That's the typically way you talk about slew rate. Instead of volts per second, you do it volts per microsecond. OK, that's just the slew rate with respect to time. So typical 13 volts per microsecond is the, what, this, what would be needed, at least that, in order to not slew with that waveform. OK? That would be a specification. All right. This is kind of odds and ends. Um, I'll come, let me do a, um, yeah. Slew rate still in microseconds, even when you, if you have like a huge current. Isn't it only in microseconds because you have like something microamp? Yeah, that's probably kind of right. I mean, it's sort of pe it's picofarads and microamps, right? Yeah, I mean, the, depends how, how big your capacitor needs to be to drive. You can easily have slew rates of hundreds of volts per microsecond, right? So mainly it's getting the capacitor small, right? That helps a lot. If you, if you, only, and you can do that if you only have a single stage amplifier, right? These mobile stage amplifiers have that problem I talked about, but if you have a single stage amplifier, then you can really get fast slew rates. OK, let's talk about how you have a new circuit that would solve the problem of slew rate. OK, or make it so it's a lot less. What is the problem? Why do we have slew rate problems? OK, let's review. OK? We have a slew rate problem because of this, right? We put a big compensation capacitor across here. There could be other circuits that we could talk about. But it's basically what happens is when we take this voltage high and this voltage low, we get limited by this current. The maximum current we can get out of here becomes just equal ISS. That's because this circuit has this kind of transfer function, right? It flattens out at plus ISS and minus ISS, depending on whether which ones these we go up and down. And we turn into a current source. What happens if we could do a different circuit that didn't do that? Can we think of a way that if we put, here's what's kind of a shame, right? We put a bigger and bigger voltage across this, and we get limited. Could we come up with a circuit if we put a bigger and bigger voltage across it, we kept getting more and more current? Well, that seems pretty good, right? Why not do that? I mean, think about a typical, uh, you know, um, source common source stage. Let's let's look at that for a second, or let's let's look at a, a source follower, right? As we source follower, here's V out. As we increase V out, right, we keep getting bigger VGS and we keep getting more and more current come through this circuit. 
right? Remember the old push-pull circuit? That's kind of why we like that circuit, because we could keep putting more and more current onto it in, in, in this direction. So that this one, we can get more and more current. In positive direction, we'll get more and more current out. And we put do a push-pull circuit, all right? This kind of thing, right? If we go in the positive direction, we get more and more current on this side. We go in the neg negative direction, we get more and more current on this side, right? So this 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 circuit has the characteristic of more and more current as we add more and more voltage. Okay, problem with this is it's not differential. Okay, so here's the design problem for you. Can we do a differential circuit that when we put a bigger differential voltage in, we get more and more current out as we make the voltage drive bigger? And it has to be both directions too, of course, right? And the answer is yes. Okay, just like we did with push-pull circuits, with a output stage like this, we can do the same thing with a differential pair. And here, there's a bunch of examples of this. Here is one. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> haven't had many new circuits lately. We've been sort of living with our old friends, differential pairs and common source. So, here's a new circuit for you. Okay, right? Now, how does this thing work? Okay, you may ask yourself. Okay, so let's just look at it for a bit here, okay? So the goal of this circuit is to figure out how to have more and more current drive to the output as we have more and more input signal. We don't want to have this, we want to have more and more signal come out of this thing as we have more and more in. So this is kind of the differential pair stage, okay? All right. Now, Here's VI plus. It's <laughs> drop my thing here. Okay. Okay. Here's VI plus. Here's another VI plus. So we just tie these. Yeah. If we have uh, increasing current with increasing differential voltage, yes. Wouldn't the gain go down then of the diff amp? With increasing voltage? Yes. And that's good. <laughs> These circuits, and I'll give you another one that's even worse, will have a variable gain as a function of the input signal. And it's not particularly good, okay, because that makes the stability problem a little bit harder, as we might guess, right? Because you're going to have to worry about the worst case gain condition, and you've got a dynamic issue going on here because the gain's changing depending on the signal, okay? But the win is that we can make the circuit a whole lot faster because we get rid of the slew rate limitation. So sometimes you just live with it, right? So, you know, it's not desirable, but it's. It's a more complicated circuit, so we're, we're going. I'll show you the other one. Just give me that one. Show you that one. Or is it just a? In fact, here, here's. That actually, this one. It's this one. This is the big GM of this circuit. You know, short the output and see what the current comes out. As a function of the input voltage, this is a function of input differential. So big GM changes like this. So when it goes way out, we're getting a lot more GM, d decreases, and there's a, this is the normal small signal GM that we'd have if we had in the small signal situation. So what you're saying is absolutely right. But you can live with it. Okay, just makes it a little harder for stability. Okay, so let's go back to this. Okay, here we go. VI plus, VI plus. So it's, and what is this circuit right here? This transistor right here is just simply a level shifter. So we're taking this input signal and also putting it down here. So this is VI plus is going into both of these inputs. Okay. It's a funny cross-coupled connection here, which we'll talk about in a second. But let's go to the other side here. Here's VI minus coming in, and here's VI minus with another level shifter. So basically, we have two levels. So we have two inputs, VI plus and VI minus. Okay. And we have their level shifted versions down here. Okay. Now, let's look for a second at this side. Okay. 
And this thing's fully symmetrical. So once we get understand one side, we can understand the other side. M6, so this has VI plus on this side. And here's VI minus on this side, okay, on M3. VI minus, because remember, it, just, it was just brought in. So we have VI minus here and VI plus here, okay? What happens, let's let VI plus be large and in the negative direction. That means VI minus will be large and in the positive direction. So that means we're putting a very large voltage across these two VGSs of M3 and M6. So as we make this voltage bigger and bigger, sure enough, we're going to have larger VGS and we're going to get larger current through this M3, M6 connection here, right? Because we've increased th that voltage. Let's say they're all everything's symmetrical. I, then the voltage, the VGS would be half for each of these transistors of Vn plus minus Vn minus. I think I actually, uh, it's a circuit that kind of looks like this. See, I've got two, this is two and seven, so I'm looking at these two, but three and six is similar, right? I'm putting these two transistors like this and I'm increasing the voltage across them, okay? So I get more and more current. Okay, what happens to that current? Well, here we got a path for the current which goes down here, through here, and down here. So if we're increasing the current because we're putting a bigger and bigger voltage across these two transistors, it's going to go up into this current mirror. This is simply a current mirror. It's cascoded. So you don't need to have the cascode. I don't know why that's, I did that to make it more complicated. But let's, it's just simply a cascoded current mirror. So that current which we have in here now is up into here, and then it's mirrored to the output. Mirrored to the output, and if, if I'm calculating G sub M, then it goes right into the output. And it has the characteristics, if I have bigger and bigger negative voltage across it, this number, this current's going to get bigger and bigger. What happens in the other direction? In the other direction, this goes negative, and this goes positive. What's going to happen is, pretty soon, this VGS, these two transistors, as soon as that gets below 2VT, a VT of this and a VT of this, these two guys will cut off. So no current comes through this side. But, like a push-pull, let's look at M2 and M7. So this one's going up now, and this is going down. We again have the same situation. We've got the VGSs of 2 and 7 are getting increased more and more as we make this differential voltage larger and larger. That will have larger current flowing down through here. Larger current through here is mirrored over to here, which comes in the output. So I get a current in the opposite direction to the output. So this circuit basically has the characteristic we like. It's differential, plus and minus, both directions. It has the characteristic that as we make the voltage larger and larger, the current keeps going up and up, you know, quadratically, right? All right. Of course, what's happening is as we have more and more current like this, we're, we're kind of being, becoming more and more, we're, it's actually in sort of a nonlinear regime because the gains change, right? Okay. As Josh mentioned, right? So, okay. So, this is, a, we say is with we have to bias this thing up initially, just like we did before, right? There, see what's going to happen. Here's I1 is setting the currents through these two transistors, okay? That I1 sets the VGS of M8 and M4. That's tied to M3 and M6, and this thing's fully symmetrical in its biasing, right? So let's look at the zero voltage condition for a second. So and effectively what we have here is that the VGS of M4 and M8 effectively is connected across M3 and M7, okay? So setting the voltage here, setting this current, if these transistors were all the same size, then we would have I1 flowing through M3 and M6 and M2 and M7. If we make ratio these transistors to these transistors make these bigger, because this is simply a little buffer, right? Because these are the real driver transistors here. 
then we'd have to sort of adjust this, you know, current to make sure we don't have too much DC bias current going through this. We've got to have this thing set up in such a way, like the push-pull circuit, we don't want to have a dead zone around zero. Okay. So, so you need to set this. And in here, I guess, in the notes, I, you know, just set VGS1 plus V, VGS1 plus 1 plus 5 is equal to 6 plus 3, because this is 0 volts and this is 0 volts. We're doing the DC bias condition, right? So you kind of go through this path right here. 0, 3, 6, 5, 1, 0. You set those equal to each other. You set the currents, and you can then, this shows exactly what I said. If you want to change the W over Ls, of course, this shows, the formula shows you how it, what happens. Okay. Now you have to ratio the currents. Okay. So let's look at what's happening with this G sub M as we do this. So I'm looking at the two M2, M7. This is this cross coupled, we call this cross coupled, right? Cross coupled pair here. M2 and M7, with the cross coupled transistors. Okay, here's M2 and M7. So I'm talking about having a positive voltage on V1. That's when this pair is active and the M3 and M6 are cut off. Okay. So here's M2 and M7. So let's look at what ha what's the G sub M that we see from M2. We can sort of do superposition here, right? So do first with M2. And what we have is a degeneration here of M7 is degenerating M2. So it's GM2 times V1 over 1 plus GM2 times 1 over GM7. So this is the um, current that's coming from M2. We'll get a similar expression for M7, okay, which will give us another GM2 times delta VI if this is minus delta VI, and they add together. So you end up with a GM times delta VI when we take these two, these two transistors together. And that current is mirrored to the output. I, mean, I don't show the cascoding here, which I complicated this circuit with. I mean, this, this cascode here does nothing more than just increase the output resistance. What's good about this circuit? This circuit could have a lot of gain, right? Because right? you've got cascoded output. You have very good differential response here. Okay. In fact, look at this output, and it's kind of interesting what this output is, in a way. Well, it's kind of like the current, it's like the inverter output we had, right? I mean, this is really an inverter right here, these two current source transistors out here, right? So this actually has a very high output impedance. Is this going to work for your project? Are you trying to drive a resistance? 1K ohm, so what's that going to do? It's just going to kill the gain, right? So, darn, it doesn't work. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's a really good circuit, and particularly if you're driving capacitance, right? Like I said, quite often we drive pure capacitance. So these kind of circuits are great, okay? What's the difference between this and the regular cascoded diff amp from, in terms of gain? I mean, I mean you're saying, because this one so gets really high gain, it's good, but so does your... Same. It's the same. It's a high gain cascoded out. Yeah. No, no, it's not the same. Yeah, no, there's nothing different here. No, the gain's the same. The small signal gain is GM the same. What really this one wins on is the slew rate business. Slew rate. Yeah, better slew rate. Um, let's see. Anything else here? See, the problem is, uh, what you end up, if, let's say you have a single, let's take our, uh, Telescopic, okay. Okay. And telescopic, as we know, is almost the same as the fully cascode, right? So. And let me just do a crude one here. Just this is not a particularly good biasing strategy, but let's say this goes off to some V bias and all sorts of things wrong with biasing this, right? This is not a high swing thing at all, right? But it's not what I'm after right now. Okay, so um, here's V out. 
here's Vn plus here's Vn minus. So in effect, this circuit is pretty much like this. We have this cascoded output, cascoded output, just like you were saying. So pretty much the same game. What's something else nice about this? Now, we didn't do a high swing circuit here, though, but we could have, right? I mean, this one has this problem of the output swing being limited, you know, by the common mode problem here, right? We have to deal with move this up and down. We end up with we got we got to worry about making sure that this current source doesn't go into linear region operation. We have got to worry about these transistors up here not going to linear region operation from the common mode swing on this problem of the circuit. So this one, pretty nice, right? This one doesn't have any of those problems, right? It's you could do a high swing condition on these two voltage, these two bias points right here. And this could swing all the way to v, two VD sats of that node and all the way to two VD sats of this rail, right? This could have a good high output swing as well. Um, let's, okay, so anything else you want to say about this? Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the level shift? Level shift? So here's the input transistor, and I want to drive this M6 with the same voltage. I want to have it VI plus on this node right here. So what's the simplest thing I could do? Just like I connected this VI plus to this VI plus, I could have just connected this right down to here. Right? That's I want a VI plus there. Why don't I just connect it there? If I connect that to VI plus here, I'll do the same thing on the other side, right? So let's look at the zero bias condition point now, right? If I have zero here, zero here, that means this is at zero, okay? So this is at zero here, this is zero volts here, this is at zero volts, and this is at zero volts. So I have zero volts across M2 and M7. Right from here, this, if this is at zero and this is at zero, there's no voltage across these M2 and M7. These two transistors are going to be cut off. Right? How much voltage do I have to have across it? Well, I got to have two VT plus two VD sats. What do I do here? Here's one VT plus a VD sat. Here's another VT plus another VD sat. So here's the two VTs plus two VD sats that I place across here in order to be able to make sure these guys are on. It's like the, it's just like that push-pull output when we put the two transistors there, remember, to make sure we didn't have that dead zone? That's the same thing here. This, this is putting, what's a little bit weird about this is that it's this transistor and this transistor, and, you know, which is, you know, you kind of got these two legs kind of mixed up. That's the cross-coupling does that to you. But the way to think about it is, this is, ex if we're doing the DC bias condition, this is zero volts. This side and this side are all exactly the same. They're the same voltages, right? So I can just look. You know, I don't. Ha I can just. This VGS is the same as this VGS. You know, they're all the same. So I'm I'm setting up this bias that this level shift here is the same as the level shift I'm getting here. So I'm kind of getting. I guess it's this level shift that I use for M7, and it's this level shift that I use for M6, all right? So it's the level shift for this side and this level shift for that side. Still don't get it. Okay, so <laughs> if you buy that zero volts from here to here is not going to work, right? Okay, zero volts here. If I tied right to there, no level shift. I mean, this is the level shift. If I didn't have the level shift, this would be zero volts. That's not going to work. So I need to have a VGS a VT plus VD sat here and a VT plus a VD sat there. Well, here's one VT plus VD sat, here's two VT plus two VD sats. And that's what I apply here. And that's minus, right? So this is at zero, and this will be at minus two VT plus minus two VD sat. Okay? I mean, you just look at this. I mean, if I look at this, let me just look at this. The level shifter by itself. So here's V in, and what's this voltage right here? It's 
pretty much Vn DC wise. Let's look at DC right now. I'm talking about DC. It's Vn minus you know a Vt plus a Vd sat, right? Plus another Vt plus another Vd sat, right? So minus two times Vt plus Vd sat. If all these transistors were the same, okay. And that's what I need to put across these guys here. Okay. Now I calculated the gain here. And you do the like I just said, big G sub M is equal to little G sub M. R out is G M R naught squared in parallel with G M R naught squared looking up and looking down. So it's G M R naught squared over two. Multiply out so you get up G M R naught squared over two, which is pretty much the same gain as our uh, telescopic. So this circuit, let me just maybe jump over it a little bit. The common use of these things. So how would you compensate this circuit? It's one stage, right? What we can do is we can put the compensate the load capacitor here, which can be equal to the compensation capacitor. That's what's really nice about single stage op amps. If you got if you're trying to drive a big capacitance, that can begin to act as your compensation. So you don't have to add any extra capacitance, okay, and you're home free. Now you may have to work the circuit may not work if you if you don't have any load capacitance at all, okay, so that maybe you have may say if you have to add a little parasitic little capacitance yourself, just make sure in case someone wanted to run this thing without any load capacitance. But typically you don't. You need to have a load capacitance as soon as you put a load on it. Where is the dominant pole in this circuit? Yeah. Where is it? Ten? <laughs> So where's that? Mega compensation, mega dominant. What is, where is it at? So if I drive this with two voltage sources, where is likely? So where could the where could it be? It could be here. Maybe it could be up there. Or it could be here. There. Why? Yeah, it's a really big resistance here, right? We look up here. What's the resistance on this node? There's a bunch of capacitance in here, but it's 1 over GM. What about down here? 1 over GM. And there's no miller multiplication stuff going on. This thing doesn't have any miller multiplication going on, so there's no big capacitors being multiplied up. So that's good. So. It's going to be probably be here. And what's the value going to be? Well, it's the output resistance of this stage, which is GM R naught squared, right? Over two. That's the output resistance at this point. Times C load. So there's the dominant pole. Where's the next pole at? One of those, yeah, right. So I mean I'm not sure either. I would guess it's probably down here. Okay. Um, it's probably a combination. I mean, you got you know this current you know, like we you know comes through this side here, right? And so we're going to lose some of this current into the pole on this node, right? And we're going to lose some of the current you know from this transistor into the capacitances on this node, right? So there's a pole associated here and a pole associated here, and they're pretty much at the same spot. And you know, and they're summed together. So that was this deal. There's probably a zero and two poles associated with these two nodes here, right? You know, I did that little analysis earlier on. So pretty much we can sort of look at and the zero and the two poles are pretty close together. So you're really talking about you can look at one of the poles at this node here to figure out where the next most next pole is going to be. Okay? And where's that going to be at? Well, you can sort of look. It's going to, there's a CGD of this thing, right? There's CGS of this, CGD of this. There's C, um, you know, CGB of here, right? C gate to bulk, uh, C drain to bulk from this guy. C drain to bulk. So you add all those capacitances up, and they're all the ground, right? This is to a ground. This is an AC ground here. This is a bias point. Yeah? Sorry, one quick question. Um, how is it 1 over GM? Because if you look at it, like, looking down, it's 1 over GM from the, from the 
uh, transistor right next to it, but then like above that it has like two transistors in series next to it. Oh, good point. Ah, good. Very good. Yep, yep, yep. Okay. So what is well? Okay. So what is the out? What is the resistance looking up into this node? Okay. Um. Okay. So here's. Okay. So that, that's really good point. Now let, let's let's look. Um, here's this issue we talk about. This is our dominant pole. So what? This pole is going to be at a much higher frequency. So what is going to happen at this? What is the impedance at this pole at this very high frequency? This capacitor is going to be a very low impedance, right? So this effectively will look like a short. Okay, but that's really good. Good point. Otherwise, it would be looking very large. It'd be R zero looking up there, right? So, right. okay. So we see it one over GM looking up there. So it's one over GM. So yeah, here's one of those cases where the two poles are coupled, right? Without CL here. <clears throat> this pole could be at a very high frequency. As we begin to add more capacitance to this node, this becomes a lower impedance point, and this pole will start to move up to a higher frequency. So there's a pole splitting thing going on here. This, as this pole goes to lower frequency, the pole associated here goes to a higher frequency, just like we saw with pole splitting in that common source stage. Okay. So this pole is going to be pretty high frequency. There's no Miller multiplication. It's looking at one over GM. So this guy is way out there. <laughs> okay. So if we look, if we plot this thing. We have our dominant pole associated with our compensation pole with this load capacitor here, C load, let's say, and way, way out there, we get the second pole. Okay. And it can easily be true that here's where the gain goes to one. Okay? Way before that second pole. So what's the phase margin of this circuit? What's the phase margin? What? Ninety degrees. Right. At ten times above mega C L we get if we, do, if we do our phase plot, right, we go here, we, we get down to 90 degrees, here's minus 90, and it just stays flat forever, right? So this thing has a solid 90 degrees of phase margin. And you can fool around with that, that, that output capacitor quite a bit, and you'll still have 90 degrees of phase margin. So this thing doesn't have a really fast rise time, but it doesn't also have to worry about having to drive a big coupling capacitor, right? Because it's just driving the load capacitor. What's the slew rate of this circuit? This is ISS. What's the slew rate? So what sets the slew rate? We put a big voltage differential on the input here. One side cuts off, the other side turns on, all the current goes through the other side, it all comes down through here. It, so it's just the same, it's ISS over CL, over the load capacitor. So it doesn't have that class AB character, we're still limited by, so these single stage circuits still have slew rate set by the load capacitor, but we don't have the coupling, remember before we had this problem of 45 degrees of phase margin, we end up with that little formula for slew rate. Well, this doesn't have any of that kind of coupling. I mean, this, I can increase ISS and I'll get better slew rate. And I don't have any problems with stability. Right? So single stage circuits are really good. And it, it really is, when you do, a lot of these circuits I'm going to show you, um, you know, A to D converters and switch capacitor filters, they typically try to work with only capacitive circuits. They try not to have resist drive resistors because of the problem of that you're seeing. You know, you have to have this output stage, you have to have multiple stages, you know, the compensation problem. Unfortunately, the real world needs to drive resistors occasionally. You have to drive speakers. You gotta, you know, all lots of times you gotta drive real values of resistance. So we can't always avoid that. We can usually avoid it in the interior of the circuit. So we come to the edges of the circuit that we get in trouble. Right. Break time.
<laughs> a lot of stuff, huh? <laughs> We're slowing down. We've got through all the hard things now, so look at it that way. It's it's we're on the we're on the slide the slide downwards. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This will be zero, and this will be zero. Yeah. <coughs> okay. But um, if we have it this way, if we connect it this way, even if it is zero, the voltage right here is going to be still Vt plus Vt sus, plus another Vt plus Vt sus right here. So that's why. Minus two. Minus well, two. Yeah. So you have minus two Vt minus two Vt sus. Right. So it'll be Vn minus two Vt minus two Vt sus. Right. Oh, okay. So even though it's really zero, you still have those voltages driving the circuit okay. at, at the same time. You got zero here, and you got minus 2VT minus 2VT sat here. Okay, so you still minus have those few voltages driving the circuit. Yeah. So this is zero, this is minus 2VT minus 2VT sat, this is zero, and this is minus 2VT. What? I was just saying, let's not have a level shifter. Take level shifter out. Don't have this. So just drive this as V in and just tie these together. Small signal. A small signal. Yeah, uh, I was talking about here, I was talking about small signal, be the same value here. But large signal, it's going to be, this is a large signal uh -huh. drop, right? Uh -huh. So a large signal, it's going to be minus 2 VT minus right. 2 VT. Yeah, I understand that. For the small signal, the small signal is going to be included here. Yeah, not exactly. It's going to be, this is, um, it's a source follower, right? Right. So this is like 1 over GM, so it's going to be in over 2, I think. Okay. Now, what's the disadvantage of this sort of biasing? Um, stability is a little tricky. Uh, a lot of transistors, a lot of stacking. Mm -hmm. Right. In order to, so we have to do this high swing business out here. Problem with stability because we have so much gain. Um, if you could live with a single stage, right? There probably is a pole inside here, right? Probably on this. Uh, what would it be? It's gonna be a pole. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's several poles in the circuit, right? Right. So, in this cross coupling business here, right? And so. No, it's a high swing. It's a pretty good swing. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The problem is, common mode's probably pretty bad, right? Yeah. Here, at some point inside the cascade, it gets just the swing is. Common mode swing is probably pretty bad, not okay. too good. Yeah, that might hurt you a little bit, right? Because you got this 2 VT plus VD sats down here, right? So, yeah. Um, and a lot of transistors, too, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's say it's the dot to a zero. So, it's going to make dot to a zero to 12. So, so, the voltage right here is going to be <coughs> VT minus 2 VD sat. So, even though this is this one and this one is going to drive into the circuit and we don't need to have the voltage gate in order to get current floating across this, right? We don't need the voltage gate. Right, yeah, the DC. It's DC in the lot. Um, say, say, ask again. Say, say again. But I mean, because if the D gate is zero, DC now. I'm a DC thing. Yes, think about that. Yeah. I was worried about. So here, this thing. Remember, I had this this plot of GM. I right? hear this right. What? 
if I don't bias this thing right, instead of this curve right here, I'm going to get something that looks like this. Of zero GM for a, a dead zone. Right? So the small signal GM will be equal to zero. I'm in trouble, right? So that's kind of why I need to sort of do this biasing to make sure. Zero, zero. zero yeah. Right. If I don't have this. I don't have this level shifting going on to make sure that I keep current going through these transistors. So level shift is to make sure current's always flowing through the transistor. Well, the R in would be the R out. Just like we did in that push-pull. Remember that push-pull? Like <coughs> I never understood why that's a dead zone push-pull. I accept it. Because you put zero volts here. If this is at zero volts. Both these transistors are off, and nothing turns on until you get up a VT above ground, right? How do they know that since the sources are tied together? Like, how does it know like how to split the source? Well, I mean, well, it's just it's this circuit here, right? So it's just um, it's it's this. It's a circuit like this, right? M two, M seven. Currents are the same. Yeah, yeah, sure. Currents, yeah, yeah. The currents, the currents the same. Oh, since current's the same VGS as iron. Okay, set. So if it was drained, then you could It's a good way to ever, but no, here it's. I wanted to um, ask them all, uh, where is your V in minus? Because in this one? It starts here. I know it's right here, but where is it in this it's one? It's a source follower, right there. Oh, because it's level shifted. Okay, yes. And one more way. Just here. Can you, um, this still has really bad swing. I don't yes. know, uh, you said you can drop a 2 VD sat. If, 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 really if, if, so if, I, if I did a high swing. Oh. I have to do some sort of high swing here, right? Last thing is, can you talk about the ACM with this thing? ACM is like, I don't really know, like AC rejection of this guy? Hmm. Come mode response. That, I don't have that uh, ISS or the resistance of the tail curve, so to speak. What the ACM is? That's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure what it is. So let's think about it. So okay, so we tie these together. These all go up. So this current is going to be equal to this current. So this current equals this current. Okay. So that's that's why it's slow. So what would what would set it? What would set it is. Um, well, I gotta figure it out. <laughs> I'm not sure it's a function. It looks like it's probably. I don't know. I have to think about that. The current does not increase with common load, right? Yeah, yeah. Because everything's balanced and everything's balanced. Right. I just don't know what's going on. It's kind of like it's probably like. You know, probably have to do how we did it in that. Um, I'll, I'll think about it. That's good. Okay. That's a good homework. <laughs> right. Remember how we did it here? Yeah, we have to do the whole small signal around the loop. No, 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 no. No, we did this other business where we said, okay, if these voltages are the same, and that makes this voltage the same, oh, okay. and then that pulls on top of each other. So if these voltages are the same, that ties this to this. And these voltages are the same, that ties this to this. So these two things are on top of each other. Wow. Probably good. No, I'll have to think about it. Yeah, that's not easy. Okay. Let's go. Lots of people here. Okay. Let's do. Here's another one. Um, so here's another class A B circuit. Okay. Uh, here's the input coming in. Okay. It drives this. You basically, you have a source follower here. Okay. And what's happening here is, in order to get, what we want to try to do is get a bigger voltage across the VGS 
as we in, as we increase our differential signal, right? So here, look how this one works. So we derive. So this is another. This is related to Vn plus. I mean, there's this actually is going to be equal. There's a current source down here. There's a voltage divider between R1 and this. So this is pretty much Vn plus down here as well. Okay. So we have this source follower. This is a level shifter again, driving M5. Okay. We've got to get some. This is for us again for this biasing condition. Make sure we don't have zero volts condition under these zero value input. Vn plus is the bottom of R2. Okay. Now let's look what's and V and on the gate of M6, it's a symmetrical. So this is Vn minus source follower again. So this is related to Vn minus as well here. Okay, we're equal to Vn minus here. So what do we have from M6 to here? We see as we increase Vn plus, this will go down. And we can see across M6 and R2, we keep, we keep getting increased value of voltage as the differential voltage gets bigger and bigger. So instead of having a current source down here, what I've replaced it with is a the opposite polarity input voltage. Okay? Same thing on the other side. So this goes negative as we make this side more positive. So we get a bigger voltage here. So what this looks like, you know, I guess you know, I'll just draw it here. So we have M2. Okay. Going into oops, sorry, I don't know. I want I'm sorry, I want M yeah, sorry. I want to look at M6, let's say. Here's M6. So this is the driver transistor. Here's Vn minus. Here's R2. And here's Vn plus. So you can see what happens as we have bigger and bigger differential voltage, we get more and more current flowing through here. This voltage goes up higher and higher. So we're not, again, we're not limited by any current source like we are in our standard differential pair. Josh had a good question. What is the common mode response of these circuits? And I think they are not nearly as good as what we've been talking about. I'll work that through on that other one or one of these just to see what it is. But I think that's probably another limitation of these circuits. Okay. Okay. In fact, I guess there's R1 plus R2 here. This is R1 plus R2 because here's Vn plus here, so it's R1 plus R2 Vn minus. Okay. Okay. Um, let me. So I just FYI, I guess. Okay. So the let's talk. Jump back a little bit for one last topic on compensation, and. We talked about narrow band compensation. There's other forms of compensation. There's other things you can do to speed up the circuit without uh, that help things out a little bit, right? So these are kind of final tweaks after you've done the best job you can to get a little more speed out of the circuit. So this is using putting in the feedback network. So now F is going to be a function of frequency. Okay. We didn't do that before, now, but now we're going to have f as a function of frequency, and we'll use that, because remember t is what we have to worry about. And we're going to make a zero in the feedback network, okay, in order to cancel out a little bit of the phase shift that comes from our poles, okay? Because if we have zero, we have a left half plane zero, remember it's t we're talking about now, right? So t is equal to f of omega times a of omega. So what we can do here is we're going to put a little bit of positive phase shift into f of omega to cancel out some of the phase shift that we get from a of omega. Okay. Now that sounds pretty tricky, right? And you can't do very much of this, but here's how much. Here's why you can do a little bit of it. If we look at this feedback network, okay, and the feedback network. Is okay. We're, this is a. What kind of feedback is this? <laughs> shunt. Shunt series, right? We're sensing in series, right? Because here's I out, so we're sensing in the source here. So that's a good clue that we're sensing 
the output current. We're not connected to the voltage, assuming this is the output voltage here, right? Okay. And we're putting we're feeding back in shunt. Okay, so it's shunt series. Okay. Um, now let's so in order the feedback network is going to be RS, RF, and CF, and this is you know shorter. This is the output of the feedback network right there. So here's our feedback network down here with its frequency dependent part, the CF. This little this little um, feed forward capacitor. Okay. Now the what is the frequency response of this network? Well, we can solve, you know, this is I out feedback, right? So F of omega of this circuit is going to be equal to I out of the feedback network, which is the current over there, divided by I out, which is the input to the feedback network, right? Okay. So we solve, so this is a current divider, right? We have a current division going on between here I mean, effectively, there's a couple current dividers going on, right? We've got a current divider here, and then we have to worry about the current, well, it's current between there and there, right? So the current, all the current here will end up going up through there. I work that little problem out, little current divider. I end up with F looking like this, okay? At low frequency, we have a current divider between RF and RS, all right? So that's the zero frequency F value, right? So this is the value we had before. This is the frequency dependent part now that we've added because we've added this capacitor here. It's a pole and a zero. Okay? But let's look where the pole and the zero are if we make RS much, much less than RF. So I'm making this small compared to RF. Okay? So this is small compared to that. If we do that, then we have, if RS is small compared to RF, then we get rid of the RS here. And we end up with this 1 plus RF J omega CF over 1 plus RS in parallel with RF times J omega CF. So if RS is small compared to RF, this just becomes equal to RS. So I end up with a pole zero pair, one at RF CF and RS CF. So the zero is at 1 over RF times CF, and the poles at 1 over RS times CF. Okay. So what is that? If we plotted that frequency response, what would it look like? Okay, what is it? Which one is at a higher frequency, the zero or the pole? If RS is much less than RF, that means the pole is going to be at a much higher frequency than the zero. So what happens to this circuit? So as we go along at, if we calculate magnitude of F, at the zero, we start to get an increase. And at the pole, it flattens out again. Okay. So this is our, this is omega P. This is for the feedback network now. This is just for the feedback network. What does the phase shift of this thing look like? This is a left half plane zero, right? It's a positive phase shift. So what the phase shift of this thing does, of the phase shift of the feedback network, starts off and it's going to go positive. It's so at 10 times below omega z, we start to go positive. At omega z, so, th so this is zero degrees. This is plus 45 degrees. And at 10 times above, we're at plus 90 degrees. Then we hit the pole, right? And it goes back down again, back down to zero. Okay. But look what we have here. In this region right here, between 0.1 omega z and omega z, what is our feedback magnitude? It's going to simply be rs over rf. Okay, more exactly, RS over RS plus RF, right? So that's what this thing starts off with. So this is our low frequency F value that we knew from this. If we didn't put this capacitor in at all, okay, that stays constant, of course, until we get up to the zero. At ten times below the zero, though, the phase shift starts occurring. 
So we're using the fact that phase shift occurs before the amplitude starts to change. So I have a nice, well-defined value of feedback, right? If this is F, right, then is equal to RS over RS plus RF. And this is a current in, current out, I out over I in is going to be 1 over F. I mean, I have a nice, well-defined value of feedback, which is 1 plus RF over RS, right? And that's not frequency dependent in this region right here. Okay. So I got this positive phase shift and a nice, well-defined value of, phase of feedback that's not changing with frequency. All right. So now, what do I do? I can now figure out what my, I can plot T. I can plot T of omega, and let's say it looks like this. I can add this zero, which actually compens which actually add the zero here. What's going on here? Okay, so this zero. I can add the zero. Let's say with the zero I add, I don't change T at all because I'm working in this region right here. Okay. And I can add, let's say, 20 degrees of phase shift. Okay. I can add that 20 degrees of phase shift by choosing a value of this CF. So at the unity gain frequency where I had, let's say, not enough phase margin. Let's say my phase margin was, um, let's see here, um, this is not quite right. This should be back a little bit. Let's move this up here a little bit, right? So let's say I had a phase margin without the zero, okay, of, I don't know what it is. Let's say it's only minus, only 30 degrees of phase margin. I add in this little plus 20 degrees at that mega unity frequency right here, okay. It's not changing the gain at all. And I can cancel out 30 degrees of phase margin, and I can add another 20 degrees. And so here I say let's do add another 20 degrees. So I'll end up, the phase shift at this point here, instead of being... Let's say to start with, I only had a phase, a phase margin before. I look at this, and it looks like it's like, oh, I don't know, only 30 degrees, OK? But I add this extra positive 20 degrees of phase shift. And so then after, I have a phase margin of 50 degrees. So by putting this little capacitor in here, I can adjust the phase margin up and down a little bit doesn't change the gain, okay? So my loop gain expression still stays the same. So I'm just playing with the phase shift a little bit there. So you can play around a little bit. You don't want to get too close to 45 because then you begin to change the gain as well. That's As soon as you, if you start changing the gain, the amplitude starts going up, right? You, that, you begin to hurt yourself again. So you don't, because zero adds gain, right? So you don't want to have, you don't want to add gain. We just want to fool around with the phase shift a little bit. This is called feedback zero compensation. It's a way to sort of adjust the compensation a little bit. This is a feed forward path through them. Okay, everybody see that? In fact, here's the phase, the plot. Minus 90 degrees, it goes down. We add this little bit of phase shift, which improves the phase shift at the unity gain frequency. That'll take it up to 90 degrees. Then later on, the next pole will come in and it'll start rolling it off again. So for a while we'll, you know, have a lot less phase shift. We've got to be sure that the gain doesn't increase enough. But we got the pole. What will happen is the gain will flatten out when we have the co zero compensating the pole. How much? Fa how do you calculate this? Let's here. I, I'm asking for 25 degrees of phase shift. So mega unity times. So here's our unity gain frequency. We want to have 25 more degrees of phase shift. Here's the zero location. So I take the tangent of that, that's equal to 25 degrees. So the capacitor is going to be 1 over RF times unity gain frequency, which is where I'm trying to get the other 25 degrees of phase shift times arc tangent of 25 degrees. And you can just figure out what the CF is. Okay. Okay. A little tweak. Any questions about that? You get the point now? So all we're doing 
just fooling around a little bit with that feedback network, adding a little bit of comp little capacitor here to add a zero. That zero is going to add a little bit of phase shift, right? If we plotted the frequency, if we plotted the magnitude response, it would look like this. Here, its magnitude response is dropping down, hits that zero, it'll flatten out, okay? After a while, at well, at ten time, it'll, it'll flatten out up here, right? So the, the phase, the that's here's where the zero hits. It'll hit it at the zero location, right? We're talking working below the zero location where we only get phase shift and no gain from the zero, and then we'll get to the next pole up, you know, up here somewhere. The next pole will come in and it'll start fooling off again. Yeah. So as a big picture, um, you just want to change the phase margin at the one the unity gain unity frequency. Gain frequency. Right. Exactly. I'm looking at the unity gain frequency, and I want to add a little positive phase shift there, so I improve the phase margin a little bit. That's exactly right. When you say improve, does that mean make it increase? bigger? Make it bigger. Yeah. More, less. The big problem you got. I mean, yeah. More, less phase margin makes the thing faster, but typically what we're worried about is stability. So more phase margin is good in the sense that it makes the circuit more stable, so you don't have to worry about the thing oscillating. That's what usually what you're fighting here is stability. Right? Is that why you choose 45 degrees as like the maximum, like optimal operating point? 45 is not bad. I mean, you know, if, if, okay. So what would you choose? If you choose 30, okay, that's probably better from the sense that it comes up may ring a little bit. The problem you also got to worry about is over over process variation, right? So we have our fast process and our slow process, okay, the different. So 30 degrees is nominal, but that's going to go up and down another plus or minus 15 degrees or something like that because of process variation. So you want to give yourself enough margin. So if you're at the situation where you're at the minus 15 degree case, so you really have 15 degrees of phase margin, then this thing really is ringing a lot, right? So 45 is a pretty comfortable, 45, 60, those kind of numbers are pretty comfortable. Even in the worst case process variation, you'll still have plenty of phase margin. Do we have to worry about that for the project? Yes. Like process variation? We're giving you a, a couple of different, a couple of different spice files. And so, oh, oh, life is so tough. It's only two weeks. Look at it that way. Two weeks and all of you done. This makes it more real. We're going to be real designers. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah. What?